Welcome to the latest lesson in our series of relativity. This time we're going to be looking at the calculation of the speed of light. This is part of the complete playlist for the series, meaning the math is no holds barred. This particular lesson does involve a certain degree of vector calculus. If you are not interested in the math, you can go to the conceptual playlist. The next video that will be available there is the problem with currents. So we're going to review some vector calculus symbols. Then we're going to look at the universal wave equation. We're going to take a look at Maxwell's equations and then talk about how the speed of light is calculated before we discuss what's coming up next. So first, our vector calculus review. So vectors of this course are going to have either three or four dimensions. The conventions we'll follow are to have three-dimensional vectors in bold. So those will be our space vectors, just x, y, z, as we are used to. Four-dimensional vectors are going to have arrows above them. So these are going to have a time component as well. And we'll get to the reasons for that much later. I'm just establishing the conventions now. There's also a standard differential operator in the spatial coordinates. So this is the gradient. We're going to be using this quite a bit today. And this identity is critical to how the speed of light was originally calculated by James Clerk Maxwell. When we take our gradient operator with the cross product, we call it the curl. When we use the dot product, we call it the divergence. And the curl of a curl is the gradient of the divergence minus the square of the gradient applied to our vector field after. So we're also going to review the wave equation. If you have a function that describes a wave with speed v, then the universal wave equation is given by the gradient squared of that function, and that is going to equal 1 over the speed of that wave squared times the second partial time derivative of that function. So these are the key preliminaries, and now we can start getting into the actual content. We're going to start with Maxwell's equations. So James Clerk Maxwell combined some known equations and some equations he derived on his own to completely describe classical electromagnetism. He managed to do all this description with what we now consider four equations. Maxwell actually worked before vector notation was common. So our four equations were 12 equations for him where the components of the electric field were DEF, magnetic field ABC, and so forth. When the vector conventions were adopted to keep things consistent, they kept the Y components, because that made, coincidentally, electric field E magnetization M and polarization P, which is why our magnetic field is B. But the first equation he has is that the divergence of the electric field is equal to the charge density divided by the electric permittivity of free space. So that epsilon of the subscript zero is just a measure of how easily electric fields can penetrate in a vacuum. If you are used to Gaussian units, things will look different here. I'm using the SI units, which are much more common these days. The curl of the electric field is the negative partial time derivative of our magnetic field. The divergence of the magnetic field is always zero. And the curl of the magnetic field will have one component that depends on J, the current density, and the magnetic permeability of free space, as well as the time derivative of the electric field, and you know, multiplied by the magnetic permeability and, mag and electric permittivity of free space. When we are working in a vacuum, then Maxwell's equations simplify somewhat. So two of them, or the divergence of B is still identically zero, as is the divergence of E. And now the curl of B is related only to the partial time derivative of the electric field plus a couple of constants. All right, so here is the meat and potatoes of it. We are going to calculate the speed of light the way James Clerk Maxwell did. 
So we had that identity, which is the curl of the curl. And we're going to take one of our two equations of Maxwell's equations that have the curl, in this case, the curl of the electric field, and apply our identity to it. We take the curl of both sides. The left-hand side, we just apply our identity. On the right-hand side, we notice that the curl and the negative partial time derivative commute. These are compatible operators, and they're all partial derivatives. So they do commute. We could flip those around. The divergence of the electric field is zero when our rho or the charge density is zero. So that simplifies one of the terms on the left. And one of the terms on the right, we could substitute. The curl of the magnetic field is proportional to the negative or to the time derivative of the electric field. Simplifying and canceling the negatives on both sides, we get this expression that now has eliminated the magnetic field and is expressed entirely in terms of the electric field. If we compare that result to the universal wave equation, we see that they are the same form provided that the speed of this electric field produced wave is given by this equation here, one over the square root of the product of the magnetic permeability and electric permittivity of free space. This equation is going to turn out to be one of the most equi important equations in history. So similarly, if we go through this starting with the curl of B, we can apply our identity and commute our differential operators, make our substitutions and our simplifications, and we get exactly the same result that magnetic waves would move at that exact same speed, 1 over the square root of the magnetic permeability times the electric permittivity of free space. Now this was a shocking revelation, because Maxwell realized that a changing magnetic field produces an electric field, and a changing electric field produces a magnetic field. So you could have electromagnetic waves that are propagating themselves. Part of the reason this was so shocking is that he was calculating the speed of electromagnetic waves. His intention was not to calculate the speed of light. At this point, all he knew about light is that it was a wave, and it was very fast. Experiments that were designed to measure the speed of light had two results. One was faster than we can measure, which are often reported as things like, you know, they thought light was moving at 120 meters per second. No, if you read the actual text, most of them realized, yeah, these time frames are just human reaction time, and we could not accurately measure the speed of light. It was only very recently at this point that someone had a number that was along the lines of the 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second that we look at today. Imperial units, that's about 186,000 miles per second. And physicists had a hard time accepting that. That was just so much faster than anything else they had ever looked at. It was literally a million times faster than sound, and sound was the fastest thing they'd seen before. They were finding that number impossible to accept, and were looking for issues and problems with the experiment that came up with it. So when Maxwell did this calculation and hit the same number, not only did it validate that experiment, but it was a complete revelation because that was when they realized light was an electromagnetic wave. They didn't understand light well enough to know that prior to Maxwell's calculation. So that calculation was a shock. And keep in mind, he ended up being able to calculate the speed of light based on two physical constants only related to how electric and magnetic fields interact with the vacuum. Those are the only two values involved. That is actually going to be vital coming up. Up next, if you're going through the complete playlist, you're going to see the Michelson-Morley experiment in detail. Then we will reconverge with the conceptual playlist that is going to be looking at the problem with currents. So please join us for these coming up. If the math here was a little too much for you, that's not a problem. You can skip to the conceptual playlist that should be running as well. And you can go directly to the problem with currents.